In this video, we'll be looking at mixtures. To begin our conversation of mixtures, I'd like to look at ways we can classify matter. The first question you can ask yourself if you find a sample of matter is does that sample have uniform properties all the way throughout? Is it the same everywhere throughout that sample? If the answer is no, you're talking about a heterogeneous mixture or a mixture that's going to have different properties in different parts of the mixture. If the answer is yes, you can then ask yourself, is there a fixed composition? Is that sample matter the same every time I find it? If your answer is no, then you're talking about a solution or a homogeneous mixture. It has uniform properties, but you can have different concentrations or different ratios of those compounds different times you find it. If the answer is yes, that there is a fixed composition, we're talking about an element or a compound, which will not be the focus of this video, but is still important because elements and compounds are what make up these heterogeneous and homogeneous solutions. Mixtures can either be heterogeneous or they can be homogeneous. A heterogeneous mixture is unevenly mixed, and it tends to have large particles. Also, you might hear heterogeneous mixtures referred to as suspensions, and that's because those large particles might be suspended in whatever it is that they're mixed with. We can contrast that with homo homogeneous mixtures, which are evenly mixed. They're the same throughout that entire mixture. They tend to have smaller particles, and we call these things solutions. The key point here is homogeneous mixtures will not separate over time. Here's some more information about suspensions. Again, suspensions are temporary heterogeneous mixtures that do not dissolve, separate over time, and they might look like they're evenly mixed, but they'll eventually settle out. Solutions are stable homogeneous mixtures, where the parts of that mixture are evenly distributed, will not separate, and the particles that are dissolved, again, tend to be small and tend to be similar in size to the particles that are dissolving. A good example of this would be salt water where the salt ions, the sodium and the chloride ions, tend to be roughly the same size as water particles. Here's some additional terms. Any mixture that is homogeneous on a microscopic level can be called a solution. A liquid mixture is a liquid plus one or more additional ingredients in small amounts. Here we can talk about a solvent, the thing that's doing the dissolving. This is typically what you have more of. And the other piece of a mixture, the other part of a mixture, is the solute, what's getting dissolved. This is what you have less of. In addition to liquid mixtures, you might have a solid mixture, two or more solids mixed with each other. An example of this might be a metal alloy. I have the picture of the Titanic because there's some thoughts that the alloy used in the hull of the Titanic was a little bit faulty and one of the reasons it led to its sinking. Now I should mention there's a third kind of mixture that you might see, and that's called a colloid. Colloids are mixtures consisting of tiny particles that are intermediate in size between those in solutions and those in suspensions. Oftentimes those particles are charged, and the charge on those particles allows the relatively large particles of a colloid to stay suspended or to stay mixed throughout the solvent. Milk is a really good example of a colloid. Milk contains globules of fat and, and protein called casein dispersed in a liquid called whey. The casein doesn't settle out, but it might be neutralized by the addition of an acid, and that would allow some large particles to form. A good property of a colloid is that they can oftentimes disperse light. So if you, dis if you dilute down a sample of milk, if you add some water to it, you can see a cone of light passing through that milk. That's a good indication that you're dealing with a colloid and is something called the Tyndall effect. It's that scattering of light by a colloid. So now the question is why? And let me ask you first, what kinds of bonding are the following molecules capable of? You have a diagram of vitamin A and a diagram of vitamin C. Pause the video and think about intermolecular forces for a moment. I'll give you the added information that vitamin A is soluble in oils, 
but vitamin C is not. On the other hand, vitamin C is soluble in water, while vitamin A is not. Can I ask you to think about explaining that? If we drop the screen here, you can see that vitamin A, the molecule on the left, which is mostly nonpolar, dissolves in nonpolar oils. Vitamin C on the right, which is polar due to the presence of those OH groups, dissolves in polar water. So what we're finding is that molecules that do similar kinds of bonding, similar kinds of intermolecular forces, will dissolve in each other. We have dispersion forces here on the left, and then hydrogen bonding, or a special case of dipole-dipole bonding, here on the right. So the key term to remember here is that like dissolves like. Polar vitamin C dissolves in polar water, while nonpolar vitamin A dissolves in nonpolar fats or oils. This is actually really important for the storage and metabolism of these molecules. Vitamin C, which is citric acid, is soluble in water, meaning that any excess vitamin C that you take will be excreted in urine. There's no danger in overdosing on vitamin C. Your body will remove any excess vitamin C. Vitamin A, on the other hand, is not soluble in water and will not get flushed out by the kidneys. Rather, it dissolves in the fat, fat cells in your body. Your body will store excess amounts, and there actually is a small danger in taking too much vitamin A. Now, don't worry, that's a really large quantity, and I would encourage you to continue taking multivitamins. As some addi additional terms here, two substances are miscible if they are completely soluble with one another, and two substances are immiscible if they do not fully dissolve. Just some other terms you might want to keep an eye out for. Here I'd like to talk specifically about dissolving ionic compounds, because this is going to work a little bit differently than covalent compounds. Remember that when a covalent compound dissolves, it will not break apart. It'll stay as a covalent molecule. Ionic compounds, on the other hand, won't. They may or may not break apart uh, as they dissolve in water. To help us figure this out, we need to look at two different steps. The first is disassociation, or the splitting of the, ion the ions from one another. Splitting the ions from each other. The second step is hydration, or the association of ions with, in this case, water molecules, but really with any solvent. And to try to figure out whether our ionic compound will dissolve or not, we need to look at the energy involved in both of those steps. The, there's a certain energy required to disassociate the ions from each other. You're pulling apart positive and negative ions. And there's a certain energy released as those positive and negative ions associate with different parts of the water molecule. Sum those energies up, and you can figure out whether it takes more energy to dissociate or more energy to, to hydrate, and whether or not that ionic compound will dissolve. Here's a nice diagram showing the different reactions that are going on. There's a reaction between the solvent molecules, a reaction between the solvent and the solute, and a reaction between the solute ions. Again, you've got to add those things up to try to figure out whether the ionic compound will dissolve or not. Rather than doing any math, we're going to concern ourselves with some solubility rules, which are a nice summary of these interactions. What you're seeing here are the different rules that dictate whether ionic compounds comprised of these ions will or will not dissolve. We're told that all nitrates are soluble, looking at the top line there. Doesn't matter what your cation is, water molecules are able to get in there and break apart that cation from the nitrate. I should mention this is all solubility in water. Look at the third line, however. Chlorides, bromides, and iodides. All chlorides, bromides, and iodides are soluble unless they're paired with silver, with lead, or with mercury. And in those cases, the interaction between silver and the halogens, lead and the halogens, or mercury and the halogens is strong enough that it can uh, it can counteract the pull of water molecules and keep those things stuck together. That is to say, the energy involved in hydration is not sufficient to pull those ions apart. Now, there probably are a couple of ions that do get separated, which means that in reality, all ionic compounds are slightly soluble. But in this case, the ions prim primarily stay stuck together and don't go into solution. A good visual example of that might look something like this. If you have a beaker with a sample of an insoluble ionic compound at the bottom, 
water molecules generally are not able to get into that ionic compound and break apart the matrix, but there might be one or two or three ionic compounds that do break apart, and you get a very, very small amount in solution. Contrast that, on the other hand, with a truly soluble ionic compound. And if you begin with that ionic compound in a crystal lattice structure, by the time it's fully dissolved, water molecules, have in, water molecules have entirely gotten between the cations and anions, and that ionic compound is entirely dissolved into its separate ions in that solution. Keep those visuals in mind as you think about dissolving ionic compounds. Two final terms we want to look at here are electrolytes and non-electrolytes. Electrolytes are very simply dissolved ionic compounds and the reason we call them electrolytes is that they'll conduct a current. So if you have a battery connected to a light bulb but a break in the circuit, you could use an electrolyte solution, an ionic compound dissolved in water, to complete that circuit. A non-electrolyte would be insoluble ionic compounds or covalent compounds. In both of those cases, there are not ions in solution, and therefore those things will not conduct a current. So let's look at the list below. It's separated into two different columns, into columns of electrolytes and columns of non-electrolytes. On the left, salt is certainly soluble, will break apart in water into Na plus and Cl minus. Hydrochloric acid, likewise, will separate into H plus and Cl minus ions. Sodium hydroxide into sodium ions and hydroxide ions. And tap water has a mi minuscule amount of ions dissolved in it and will conduct a current slightly. Sugar water, on the other hand, sugar is covalent, will not break apart in solution, and will not conduct a current. Gasoline, another covalent compound, will not break apart into ions, will not conduct a current. And distilled water, by definition, is pure water with no ions in it, and therefore that water will not conduct a current if there's nothing else involved. Here's a list of terms that came up in this lecture. Be sure that you can define those, and if not, go back in the video and watch it again to make sure that you understand all these different terms. As always, thanks for watching.